Welcome, everyone. I hope you have a seat or that you will find a seat. Our enormous Zoom audience is watching already, so we're going to need to start. I'm not so sure how, how enormous that Zoom audience is, actually. So. Okay, so thank you all for coming to the inauguration of HIP Santa Cruz number six. We congratulations on having lived through it all this long. Really, seriously. Uh, if, you, if you started in the 60s like I did, you thought every day was going to be your last because of nuclear destruction. I hope you haven't thrown that idea out. <laughs> it is still there. So anyhow, just to put a little edge on everything, keep us all alert and more alive to the moment. Um, we have several readers tonight, and um, we're going to try to keep it to around six minutes to seven at the max for each selection, selection from the book. Uh, we're going to read a few, few selections from other books as well, from uh, number three and number five. We have people here from that. Um, so we'll get to that as we go. So first of all, our first reader will be Ralph Abraham, who is one of the co-editors of this book and the man who started the entire series and inaugurated the discussions, which we had for years with tape recorders running and everybody uh, talking <laughs> and listening. And so what these volumes are, are a selection of oral stories from people who survived the 60s, 70s, 80s, and we're bringing it all the way up till today uh, because we're still here and we haven't gone anywhere, and we know that the movement that did not initiate in, in Santa Cruz, but was part of a worldwide phenomena, uh, nevertheless, that phenomena is still shaking people and civilizations all around the world. Well, the, the, the organic gardens, this is Mark Hartst Max Hartstein's painting of Camp Joy. Uh, Jim Nelson, who lives in that wonderful house and who started Camp Joy, will be reading from his piece too. But let's start it off with Ralph. Oh, thank you so much. So interesting to be here in these gatherings of our clan, approximately one a year now. This is number six. So officially, it's a book launch. But in fact, the function of the book is just to nucleate this group. So the first volume, uh, published, I don't know, five or six years ago, contained uh, interviews with the original pioneers of HIP Santa Cruz. And um, I think of 10 or 12 authors of memoirs, chapters in volume one, all have died now, except for a couple. I'm one of these uh, survivors. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, one of the non-survivors is uh, Paul Lee, who was very instrumental in many uh, projects that he created in Santa Cruz County. And he was a big fan of, thank you. But now we have the feedback problem. So um, Paul Lee was a, a great supporter of this project and uh, served as the editor of uh, all the volumes except this one. And he died last October. And so I'm going to read from my um, memorial to Paul Lee. Let me hold that for you. And you can just concentrate on reading. I can also hold OK. So the, uh, <clears throat> this is. Uh, I think, uh, chapter two of uh, volume six. And it has a long quotation from an article written by Paul Lee, uh, which is kind of autobiographical. So I'm going to read 
uh, his writing. I remember the first time I saw Ralph Abraham. It was at a faculty meeting in the fall of 1968. He was sitting in the front row. I did a double take as I walked by. I thought, holy shit, they hired A.B. Hoffman. Now they've gone too far. <laughs> we were asked to lead a student protest against the regents who were making a visit to the campus. Reagan was governor. The Democratic Convention police riot in Chicago had happened a few months before, and the campus was a tinderbox ready to explode. Ronnie and the regents were the match. I arrived, this is Paul Lee again speaking, I arrived for the march wearing my Harvard PhD robe, red silk with black bands, a representative of lawful order and adult circum circumspection. Ralph showed up wearing an American flag shirt. We both had beards and Ralph had an afro out to there. <laughs> the students, for the most part, behaved, but there were some outside agitators from Berkeley who acted as provocateurs and wanted to foment trouble. I invited the biggest loudmouth out into the parking lot, but he declined. Paul Lee was uh, large and also uh, an expert in the sport of boxing. Bill Moore, who was to become a graduate student in the History of Consciousness program, had called for a Black Studies College in honor of Malcolm X, and the Chancellor, McHenry, had laughed derisively at the suggestion. Bill was considered an outside agitator, an inside agitator, sorry, and was persona non grata for making speeches on the campus. In the middle of the ruckus, he was removed from the campus by the police. I found out about it and picked him up at the bottom of the campus where he had been deposited and brought him back where we were met by student supporters with whom we locked arms and marched into the Crown College courtyard. There we were met by Rich Townsend, a student sympathetic to Moore's proposal, who told us that Jesse Unrau and a number of regents were waiting to talk to Bill in we went to the Crown Library, and Bill sat down to repeat his proposal, this time to sympathetic ears. Eventually, the X in Malcolm X was transposed to Oaks, and a college devoted to Black Studies was instituted. So this was the fall of 1968, by the way. Ralph's in my picture appeared in many of the state newspapers in articles about the demonstration. Hate mail poured in. People didn't like professors with beards, and they really didn't like their flag worn as a shirt. McHenry dutifully sent copies to us with a little red check on a tab on the side of the document. One of them suggested we fill our pockets with shit and lie down in front of a bus and become instantly embalmed. I thought that was a sample, uh, an example of rare imagination. Ralph had tenure and I didn't. I thought the jig was up for me and it turned out to be true. Even though the Crown faculty gave me a vote of confidence at the time, which was really a veiled kiss of death. Nada has a piece from, uh, what, volume three? Volume three. Right. Paul went on from that so-called fall from grace at the university and uh, became a spiritual millionaire. And here's his. So I have to say I was very good friends with Paul Lee, thanks to Ralph Abraham, who deposited me in, at Paul's house and said, Paul needs you. And I was... Uh, Luckily, honored and privileged to be one of, for me, he was one of my best friends in his final year, his final decade. So it's a real honor to be able to read his works. Paul Lee, how to become a spiritual millionaire when money is no object. 
After a lifetime of involvement in nonprofit corporations, I am convinced that everyone should get one or get involved in one. The nonprofit corporation represents one of the great institutions between the family, government, largely unsung, often unnoticed as an institution. There are over one and a half million nonprofits, according to the Urban Institute, in a recent editorial, this was back in the New York Times in 2013. Peter Buffett, yes, that Buffett, who runs his father's foundation, refers to the growth of nonprofits. According to the Urban Institute, the nonprofit sector has been steadily growing between 2000 and 2011. The number of nonprofits increased 25%. Their growth rate now exceeds that of both the business and government sectors. It's a massive business with approximately $360 billion given away in 2012 in the United States alone and employs more than 9.4 million people. Uh, just an add-on, well, I'll tell you at the end. Um, so these numbers are astonishing, of course, and we want to go into the historical roots of the spirit in the religious movement in Europe and sectarian Protestantism. Um, but what, and this is Paul Lee's words, I make reference to the golden rule as another expression of spiritual substance. Following Paul recurs interpretation that takes the golden rule into an economy of gift and an ethic of superabundance. In doing so, I salute all of those who have eschewed an economy of greed and an ethic of what's in it for me and an ethic of self-interest and instead have followed a life of self-sacrifice where they have given of themselves for the public good and are exemplary of what I call civic virtue. I've had the pleasure of working with countless people who have exhibited the spirit and I have enjoyed the surplus value of this generosity in behalf of others, thus principle of plenitude. It has spilled over in my lap. I want the reader to learn from my experience as I tell the story of my involvement in a number of nonprofit corporations during the course of my life and to see these examples as a microcosm of a larger institutional structure in American public life. I hope that when I've benefited from this in, in the work is an inspiration for others who are drawn to a life of public service. Paige Smith was another great friend. We left the university in 1972 to start the William James Association, one of the outstanding adventures of my nonprofit experience. I owe him more than I can say, someone who threw in his lot when I was churned out of my teaching career and stood by me when it counted most. The year was 1966 the year I was born, me personally. <laughs> I had taken up teaching duties at the University of California, Santa Cruz in a definitive move to give up, to give my life a new direction from Cambridge, Massachusetts to California, from Harvard and M MIT to a new campus of the University of California system that had just begun a year before. I had, I, well, four years later, I had earned a sabbatical in Wisconsin at our summer home at Cisco Point on North Twin Lake, where I could think about my future now that my present had come to an end. I had had a short shelf life at the university, and it was pretty clear I was going to be denied tenure, partly for starting in an organic garden at the first at a university in the country and pissing off my scientific colleagues at Crown College because they thought organic meant artificial synthesis, as in organic chemistry. <laughs> they thought nothing of calling a factory a plant. Our throwback was practically medieval return. It was this garden that I started with Alan Chadwick in 1967, eschewing the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Worse yet, it was seen as a hippie plot, devised to embarrass them further. That's what the scientists thought. After all, wasn't flower power one of the operative hip slogans of the time, identified with the hippie revolution? Organic schmanmic. My career in teaching was on the line, and the handwriting was on the wall. So I wrote to an old friend of mine how I, be, how I became a spiritual millionaire. I wrote to an old friend 
from Harvard, Bill Russell, who had become a freshman dean at Harvard, who would send me any material on the Harvard student agencies that I might use as a model for what I had in mind. And he did. And I noticed that the main project was training bartenders. There were a great demand at Harvard, but I wasn't interested in that effort. But the structure of the agency is what I wanted. He goes through um, a bunch of theological, you'll, you'll need to read it. Um, so I'm going to get to Williams James. <laughs> Williams made it clear to me that the principle of voluntary association began in a certain evening in 1952 <laughs> when a Roman Catholic priest by the name of George Blarock was rebaptized. It was the matter of starting over. An anti-Baptist wing of the Reformation churches was the outcome. And you could gather together at someone's home and exercise the freedom of worship in the context of voluntary association, and it wasn't anybody's business what you did. The most radical expression of autonomy, acting off of your own bat, was thus enacted and became a historical event. It is known as taking matters into your own hands free of domination of others. And then we get to Alan Chadwick, who was a great inspiration for me. Well, maybe it's time for me to go. No, but <laughs> that's what you want me to talk about. Alan Chadwick was a great inf inspiration for me, though it wasn't something I didn't reflect on at the time, even though I registered it. He was, a gener he was generous beyond measure. Everything in the garden was given away on the basis of an economy of gift, as I would come to call it. He had no interest in money, and it took some months for us to get the university to pay him a salary, and it was around $400 a month. He simply accepted it and put most of it back into the garden. He worked seven days a week and on average 18 hours a day. So what does that come to in an hourly age? You do the math. Um, so he wrote about that um, in There is a Garden in the Mind, his book. Um, and he's talking about um, Chadwick and the French intensive and the biodynamic method. And he's accredited for inaugurating the organic movement in California. And his influence was remarkable, reaching all the way to the new California cuisine, cuisine as represented by Alice Waters at Chez Panisse in Berkeley and Deborah Madison at Green's Restaurant in, in San Francisco. Well, let me just, one more thing. As much as anyone I knew, Chadwick embodied the spirit of the new age. He gave himself tirelessly to the redevelopment of his gardens and imparting a new understanding of one's relation to nature. Let's see if this works. Yeah, I want to have Jim read next because okay. he's got a bit about uh, Chadwick. And then, and then, yeah. Okay. Uh, All right. <clears throat> Uh, so my piece that I submitted to this volume is called A Letter from a Garden Variety Planet. And, and I'm going to talk about that in just a minute, but I wanted to start with a PS. Um, and because when I, there's so much to write about, and, and, and I'm feeling that more and more as I heard both of you read and um, there, so I, I chose one little part uh, to write about, but I, I was think, I was wondering, uh, one of the lessons of the 60s that I learned was that uh, growing up in the, during the civil rights movement and the birth of the environmental movement was that if you participate in a democracy, you can make change, you know, albeit it's incremental change and the challenges are, go on and on and on. But um, I, I think that there's people in the Santa Cruz community, and, I, I'm, and I'm one of them, that um, delved into um, 
community, being involved with a community. I was on the Water District Board of Directors for 12 years up in the San Lorenzo Valley, and I got to play a role in preserving the headwaters of the San Lorenzo Valley. Um, <laughs> Yeah, in, in, the, in the office at uh, the home office of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, there's a poster, a, a drawing that was sent to us by Julia Butterfly Hill, thanking us for that action. And uh, that uh, meant a lot to me at the time. And then the other issue that I was involved with was um, bringing local control to the to the people of Felton, bringing Felton into the district uh, instead of being owned by RWE, which was an international conglomerate located in Germany that whole, held uh, water rights in huge areas of California and all across the country. They also owned the water rights for Felton. And, it, and both of these projects took numerous years of consensus building and, and but in the end we um, achieved we won a, the eminent domain trial and mediated a fair price to buy it from RWE and and bring it into local control Thanks. so yeah <laughs> Okay, okay. So um, the piece that I wrote um, is called A Letter from a Garden Variety Planet, and it tells um, some of the story of the principal events and some of the key people that were involved in bringing uh, about the UCSC Allen Chadwick Garden and in, in, in inviting Allen to be the one to start that project. And uh, uh, so that, that is part of the body of what I wrote here. Um, and, but the part I want to read is um, in 1968, um, plus 25 years is what, 80, no, 93. So um, there was supposed to be published a piece written about the, for the 25th anniversary of the Whole Earth Catalog, Whole Earth Review. And so I wrote this piece in, in, in about 92 or 3 and submitted it. Well, for some reason, the whole thing fell apart and it was never published. So now I'm so happy that I finally got it <laughs> in this book. So, um, and this, this sort of documents in a, in a prose poem, stream of consciousness sort of way the impact that working in Alan Chadwick's garden had on me. So here we go. 1968, dream of change, dream of peace, hope for love, hope for joyful work, beneficial work. A world gone insane, war and greed and consumption, assassinations. Change your mind, change your diet, change your heart. Find a truthful and direct life. Somehow go back to nature. Remember and practice the lessons of wildness. Dream of change, marches, songs. A young old man standing on a hillside, eyes sparkling, hair tossed back, mischievous, hands gesturing, working, holding life gently, showing us how to use our hands and our imagination, teaches about art, horticulture, fine foods, aromas, learn techniques, tools, discipline, parties and picnics, hikes, learning, talking, observing while you work, pinch myself, I am being transformed by my actions. Get up at dawn with the light, sun sparkling on dewdrops, birds singing the dawn chorus. I am just a part. Rocky hard soil, baccarus, broom, poison oak, road cuts, 
Dream, imagine, attend to details, work together. Camaraderie, enliven the soil. The plants are as alive as you. The soil is our flesh. There's food to eat, beautiful vegetables you could hardly imagine. There is a heritage. Preserve the earth, save and simplify, but also nurture and enliven and create. Be careful, observe, use your hands and your mind and the hillside changes. Beautiful flowers and food and friends and we still had lizards and snakes, birds singing and bucket drinking, air full of insects and sweet and earthy scents. Work on problems, accept failures, sleep in the woods, don't worry about money or time. Time is the moment pulsating with life. Reality can be touched and tasted and smelled in the garden. Tired, sore bodies work to transform the nature of the university, integrate art and agriculture, science and humanity. We have succeeded and failed. Times are better and worse. People have had answers and solutions, finding and doing them all along. Change yourselves until you outnumber the gray people. Wait and work. Stay alive. Find out what makes you really alive. The next 25 years, it's harder now, but maybe you've learned something, are wiser, more experienced. Ripples have spread, roots and shoots sprouting all over. Keep on working, remember your teacher, your real teachers, so perhaps you can be one. It's a small, fragile planet. Plants, wild and cultivated, give us everything. Our air, our food, our shelter, our clothing, and the beauty of a live, pulsating planet. We need more gardens, more tree planters, more people living simply, creating and transforming our place on Earth, and celebrating our diverse society. The garden message is as vital today as in 1968. More and more of us must sing its many songs that we have learned and that we have and that have grown and bloomed around our planet. We are stronger now, and how well we sing will create our future. Dream of change, dream of peace, hope for love, hope for joyful work, beneficial work. So you know, Jim painted. Uh, Jim has Jim painted the painting on the right, and the uh, painting on the left is by Max Hartstein, who is one of our very first contributors uh, to Volume One, actually, and uh, was head of the 25th Century Ensemble, which is probably the most insane collection of musicians I've ever run into in my life, uh, and all of them playing on acid simultaneously. <laughs> for hours in the barn. It was all recorded, and they used to play it on some KTAO or something like that over, and, and anyhow, never mind. <laughs> Madness, but this, these are beautiful paintings. Thank you, Jim, for bringing them in to show them. Um, right. Uh, we have three more readings. The next one is uh, uh, Rick. He's, re he's gonna be reading for uh, Phil Wagner's piece fills in Utah not well at all at the moment. Hopefully, he's not going to be among the missing for next time. Um, so one, one thought is people yes. standing. You know, yeah, all oh, right, good seats, point. You can even sit down in their seats here. Uh, the stage. Uh, why don't we take a five seat, four seats. Don't be afraid. You don't have to read if you come up here. <laughs> but people will look at you. <laughs> yeah, come on in. Sit on the stage. Why not? Join us up here. 
Okay. Rick, can you can you stand, stand up? Okay, sure. go for it. I need the exercise. Yeah. Hi, I'm Rick, Rick Gladstone. Uh, I've written a couple of pieces for this series, one under my actual name, a couple under my other name, Rick Allen. Closer to the mic. I'm going to raise it up a bit. There we go. Sing into it? <laughs> Closer? Yes, yeah, sink into it. Let me read this up. So this is a piece by uh, Phil Wagner, who was in the first rock and roll band in Santa Cruz history back in the 50s um, out of Santa Cruz High School. Um, this has been written about in a couple of other issues, and that's what's a couple of other volumes. This was nice about this series. You can get a different look. Uh, of, a, of a similar uh, experience from a couple of different point of views. And I'm going to read a short piece, short pieces from it here. My family moved from Watsonville to Santa Cruz in 1946. I was four. Is that okay? Can you hear me? Santa Cruz then was a sleepy retirement town with its curious, unique seaside energy. Fortunately for me, people who live near the ocean have a more liberal outlook than those who live inland. I was happy. Why? Maybe the two-piece bathing suits, the beach parties, the total luxury of just lying on the beach, getting a suntan for free, reading a book, playing volleyball, going surfing, looking at the vast ocean, a far horizon teasing out my mad imagination. At an earlier age, Perhaps we beachgoers became aware of the vast possibilities of one another's bodies. We discovered we could purchase condoms at the town clock <laughs> billiards parlor or the United Cigar on Pacific Avenue. For those of you who are locals, the town clock was also, of course, Ed's. We referred to it as Ed's billiards. Birth control condoms were illegal in many states until 65, Connecticut being the last state to ban them. Then for us, along came Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard, and pulled the cork out of the bottle. The genie was out of the magic lamp. Rock and roll was here to stay. Call it freedom, call it individuation. Then in 1959, the birth control pill hit the scene. With that much freedom, you knew things were gonna change, and they did. In 1960, you could purchase acid at the Hip Pocket Bookstore. I will say that. You all can check with your own memories. I don't think it was quite, quite that early uh, for the Hip Pocket or for acid in Santa Cruz. In the early 1950s, but we all remember it in the best, <laughs> the best way we can. Um, it's all, it's all good. In the early 50s, outside Santa Cruz, paranoia still reigned with anti-communism, evangelism, the Red Scare, Senator Joe McCarthy, the eminent atom bomb attack, the Cold War, of course, 101 religions with their endless scare tactics. But Santa Cruz, with the beach and the copper tone bodies, seemed immune. Of course, yes, Santa Cruz had their fair share of fear-driven religions doing their fear-mongering about devils and sins of the flesh, etc. But the Bible thumpers worldview didn't find fertile ground with us because we already had our own center point, experience of freedom, something to do with the beach. Uh, so it's kind of a metaphor uh, in a way for things. I'm going to skip ahead real quick. Phil has a way of um, characterizing things. He, he's well-educated, and it comes through. In the midst of this Cold War, a middle-class American America had been born, and we teenagers benefited. We could purchase Fender electric guitars, drive cars, enjoy a world outside the admonishing eyes of the church, state, or parents, and we did. We endured the continual condemnation by fundamentalist religions. We persisted. As evidence, in 1956, I recall an all-Mexican band led by a screaming sax player named Chuck Higgins, which came to the Civic Auditorium. Fate. 
by the way, this is covered in a couple places else in this series. It's interesting to read the different takes. The teenagers went wild, dancing indecently. Higgins had a hit tune called the Pachuco Hop, which galled the authorities. The Santa Cruz police chief shut the dance down, and the very next day, rock and roll was banned from Santa Cruz. Parenthetically, first time rock and roll was outlawed in the world. Yay, Santa Cruz. That cultural ban for indecency didn't hold for long, but it reflected the basic thinking of the time, namely that people had to be trained to be controllable and controlled at all times. They could not be free. In 1958, the Dukes, that was Phil's band, uh, along with Ed Pennyman, Teddy Templeman, a couple other guys, the Dukes, of, 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 uh, the Dukes were playing a dance at Holy Cross Church Hall, and the nuns kicked us off stage. Couples were getting lewd, colliding, and dancing too close, weakening their moral resolve. People out of control of the authorities were seen to be sinners. Rock and roll was seen to break the laws of common decency. Bill Kelly, a guitar playing friend, was punched in the head by an offended member of the audience while singing some suggestive song on stage. Uh, and a coda here at the end. The Dukes of rock and roll were part of the history of Santa Cruz and of a changing society. In 1950 through 70, music, writing, poetry, the avant-garde, nouveau art, new forms of psychoanalysis, all were beginning to open up Santa Cruz and was part of the change, moving society away from a closed society with fear as its prime motivation, fear generated by religions and governments for their own benefit. As a minor revolution, hip Santa Cruz was pushing toward an open, empathetic society, one that exists for the evolution of humanness. Dan Freeman is in our volume six. He's one of our early adventurers here, and he's got quite a story to tell. In seven minutes. So I have uh, chapter eight in volume six uh, is my chapter called Santa Cruz Mountain Memories. Part one, Alba Road, 1968-1970. I first moved to the Santa Cruz Mountains in May 1968 after finishing my third year at Reed College in Oregon and a brief visit to my parents. I got a ride to Pacifica and hitchhiked down Highway 1, then up Highway 9 carrying only what fit in my trusty old Kelty backpack. I walked the last half mile or so to join my companions, Roxanne and Terry, at 1000 Alba Road. Ben Lomond. Just a moment, please. We've got to work this out. OK. That hum is driving everybody nuts. This is better? Yeah. Yeah. This is this stopped humming? Yeah, I'll hold it for you. Sorry. Go for it. <clears throat> that property had been the home of a nudist colony known as Eden West, I no longer recall the stories of why or how the colony disbanded, but for the last couple of years, the land belonged to a smaller group of people who began to call themselves the New Family. The family was led by Eric Klau, um, an architect in his late 40s. I was a bit overawed by Eric, that busy, benevolent bear of a man, but I found the others quite approachable, especially Michael, a slender man in his early 30s, who was happy to share his vast trove of back-to-the-land lore and skills, and his insight into new family, new age family dynamics and self-actualization. Matriarch Carol and early 30s Carol also occasionally took us under their wings. We were impressed and inspired by their warm and stable group marriage. At that time, 1000 Alba Road covered about two sunny acres, including a large vegetable garden fenced against the deer, a serious compost pile and chicken coop, a dozen fruit trees, and a deep oval swimming pool thick with green algae. The new family lived in the main house and rented out a smaller boxy bunkhouse near the property's northern boundary. Somehow, Roxanne and Terry, my friends, had managed to become their tenants the previous fall. A few words about my companions. Roxanne and I had met in high school at an anti-war weekend gathering in La Honda, sponsored by the Quakers 
AFSC. About a year later, we began an on-again, off-again affair. She started college at UC Riverside, but transferred to UCSC in fall of 67. Terry, the younger brother of my high school friend Paul, had begun pre his pre-med studies at UCSC the previous year. Roxanne wanted to try a menage a trois. Terry and I had misgivings, but we were willing to give it a try. <laughs> I have fond memories of the summer of 1968. I, I slept on a platform suspended from four tall redwood trees. The hillside at the boundary of 1000 and 1010 Alba was steep enough that I could walk nearly a level plank out to an 8x8 platform and from the far end look down about 30 feet to lovely Alba Creek. The creekside ram pump occasionally would kick in, ka-thump, ka-thump, to send water up to the swimming pool and the garden. Nobody wore clothes, just a hat and sandals, except to go into town or on a chilly evening. It only took me a couple of days to get used to it, and soon I too had a nice overall tan. Terry turned out to be even a better companion than I expected. Incredibly generous and warm, he was, and still is, always looking for ways to make the world a better place. Sometimes he would take me uh, to work alongside his friends in, the, in Alan Chadwick's garden at UCSC. I learned to double dig the clay soil, incorporate compost and leaf mold and crushed limestone, to sow seeds densely and to use lots of mulch in what Alan called the French intensive or biodynamic method. Organic farming in Santa Cruz and beyond was uh, seeded by Alan's apprentices, including Terry's friends, Jim and Beth, who founded Camp Joy in Boulder Creek the following year. Rapid changes came to Alberta. How am I doing for time? Okay, carry on, carry on. You've got another couple of minutes. Uh, came to Alba Road in uh, 1968. I remember Michael telling me the news of Robert F. Kennedy's assassination in June and of the new family's plans to leave the U.S. before it imploded. My future uh, seemed, that future seemed quite plausible as political chaos descended on many cities following Martin Luther King's assassination and the continuing escalation of the Vietnam War. The new family put a deposit on a 100-plus acre parcel in the Slocan Valley in remote British Columbia and put 1,000 Alba up for sale. Fairly soon, they had a buyer connected with Pacific High School, a radical alternative private high school off Skyline Drive. Fortunately, by then, the owners of, one th of 1010 Alba Road needed caretakers and offered us the job. Free rent in exchange for maintenance and minor repairs and improvements, I kept the platform over Alba Creek. Our sleeping arrangements were a bit complicated, taking a cue from the new family. As I understood it, uh, each day the two carols decided together where the men would spend the night. Uh, uh, Roxanne would choose, and for us, Roxanne would choose to spend some nights with me on the platform, some with Terry, and occasionally by herself. I don't recall Terry ever complaining about the arrangements, but Sometimes I was unhappy. With chagrin, I can still remember throwing a tantrum one August afternoon in the Sierra. The three of us got a, had got a ride to Mineral King on the west side of the range and backpacked for 10 days, living mainly on rice, oats, fern fiddleheads, and trout. Tantrum aside, it was a glorious trip. We hitchhiked back home from Whitney Portal on the east side. Thank you. Getting, getting about your time. Okay, so I go on to tell... Um, Oh, you want me to finish the read? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's just... Uh, 1010 Alba Road got less sun than 1,000, especially in the winter, but Terry and I put in a vegetable garden in the sunniest spot at the end of the driveway and dug in the last few wheelbarrows of chicken shit from the now empty coop at 1,000. Once we and the cat we inherited got proficient at catching gophers, the garden gave us good harvests, and so did an avocado tree. It's, uh, um, the next couple of paragraphs are about making a living, and if, you know, do you want to? That's, that's okay, we can stop right there. It'd probably be a good <laughs> idea, and if we got more to overlap, what okay. you have there, that's what you have. Yeah, there. so that's the beginning of, of chapter eight. I go on to talk about uh, some other events, Fun Alba Road, and then uh, a, a time when I was back in Santa Cruz in the town uh, for a while, and then there's part two, 
uh, uh, living in, in Lompico uh, on some raw land, putting in a, a dome, a geodesic dome, and then a, a, a cabin mainly made from uh, thinning redwood trees, the second growth redwood trees on the property. Uh, you know, and uh, just uh, the life, uh, somewhat communal life and you know, life in the mountains uh, in those days. And then at uh, Ralph's suggestion, I did a coda talking a little bit more about my life since then, but my time in Santa Cruz Mountains ended in 1974 as, you know, a full-time place to live. And since 1985, I've lived in town in Santa Cruz. On the west side? Yep, lower yeah, lower west side. All right. Um, thank you. Um, there are, uh, okay, well, um, I think, I thought we had another reader, but we don't. Uh, so, no, Mary's not going to read. <laughs> she has a book, she could read from it, but we didn't, she said, no, thank you. <laughs> this is, this is, um, I'm just going to read two short pieces from, uh, Does the, hold the mic for you, oh, thank you, uh, from, from the, from the coyote teepee, um, I have four pieces in here. I know it sounds, uh, we had to fill up the space. We, it was too damn small, so I pulled out some other pieces that were relevant, I thought, and um, including my first DMT trip, but uh, that is not what I'm going to, but that is not what I'm going to read to you for now. <laughs> no, but this book is full of enticing pieces from all kinds of people, and the idea of today's reading was to read little sections and whet your appetite and have you gam rush out there and beat yourselves up each other to try to, who can read, get the last 15 copies. And uh, well, however, there are a lot more copies on Amazon and uh, you can get them there. Or at the bookshop Santa Cruz. Yes. yes? Yes, okay, right. So anyhow, what I want to do is read just two, uh, two very simple little pieces from the Coyote Teepee. I don't know, anybody here remember the teepee out of Cabrillo? Uh, it existed for about 12 years. It spontaneously arose out of the first class that ever uh, met in the Native American literature format. And um, as a group project, uh, 30 people from all over the world worked on that damn thing, put it up, created it out of an imagination, and it lasted for, I know, of over 15 years' worth of classes that were held in that teepee. Uh, 70 to uh, about 84, 85, I believe, is when it finally uh, was given to um, another person, uh, a Native American, a Lakota Sioux. Um, I forget his last name right now. I didn't, I didn't do the gifting, but uh, an, 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 another teacher at Cabrillo did. So let me find this piece. Trying to talk and find something at the same time is... <laughs> Yes, difficult. Okay, um, the first one is a very short, not a relatively short piece by, um, here's the thing. We would meet in the teepee at, and oftentimes we were at night. All we had was a fire, okay? So everything I'm gonna read to you was written down by firelight and uh, some of these are from my gleanings and others are from the class gleanings because I got to keep some of the readings, uh, some of the people, some of their notes. And so these are some of the notes that we had. And um, damn it, I had a mark and I lost the marking. So I'm just going to start with Wallace Black Elk. Uh, he's a hell of a guy, Wallace Black Elk. And I'm just going to go, uh, I'm going to introduce him. He's Wallace Black Elk. He's, um, he was there with his uh, half self, spotted grace spotted eagle, and I'm going to read one of her pieces too. Um, and it just starts out with his voice, and I'm just going to go with him uh, as much as I can. Ho, Batakwiasi means all my relations in the Lakota language, which is thousands of years old. I have come to speak to you tonight because you wouldn't come to me out on that reservation. Reservations are little concentration camps created by the U.S. government to lock up people who were free. When the white man came, he saw the teepee's door is always open. So he walked in, stole everything, our homes, our land, our children, our religion, our pride. What about all those commandments that Jesus' people use as a shield to hide behind? 
Love thy neighbor, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. They creep up close with sweet words, and then they grab you. They say, follow these rules or else. But they don't do it themselves. I see right off that some of you are getting uncomfortable, but that's all right. If you can survive, if I can survive you for the last 500 years, you can survive me for just one night. You never heard what I think because you never asked until now. When your teacher asked us to speak, he wanted to know when we were going to t what we were going to tell you. I said, I have no idea. Well, well, when can you come? I have no idea, I told him. Earth people don't have no weekends, no Sundays, no Fridays, no September or, or May. For every day is now. And it has a beginning and an end. And that's why we came tonight, because he asked us, even though we're not on your schedule. Now, just to put the record straight, I'm not an Indian. I'm not an American either. I'm an Earth man, a living book. And I'm proof that John Wayne didn't kill us all off or die of diseases. <laughs> In spite of the history books, we're still here. Remember that the victor wrote the histories but they don't always tell the truth. The truth is embarrassing. The truth is genocide. Back in BC, before Columbus, there were over 250 Earth people languages, one for every nation. There are many other languages as well, the eagles, the buffalo, deer, bears, butterflies, even little ants. They all have their own brains, hearts, spirits, and languages. Mother Earth speaks with many voices. Even the plants are talking to each other, but we can't hear them anymore. Back in BC, we could all speak to each other. Now it's all static and music and beer commercials on the radio and TV. It's the same city at the end of every road, filled with the same Denny's and McDonald's, the roaring of trucks, buses, cars. Now we can't hear anything, not even ourselves. We forgot how to listen. What if I was to tell you that a prophecy from nine generations ago said that a society would be here and create a monster which would grow real fast and try to swallow the world, but there's fire in the rock and he'll explode it and blow his head off. Would you listen to that? It's a modern history, I think, this apocalypse. It already happened to the Indians. So, for who is this government that is out of control? Who is responsible? This guy, Ronnie, what's his name, bought and paid for all those bombs and things with your money, and he believes in Armageddon. And if he wants to use them, who's going to stop him? How is he going to make war? I hear he's even going to make war with, with the stars. And that brings us up to date from B.C. to A.D., to us ignorant Indians, A.D. means atomic destruction. But what do we know? We're just savages. So his wife has half, has half so. <laughs> and the dialogue goes back and forth, but uh, I'll just read her so you can get a little taste of her too, uh, although her voice was so incredible. Um, she says, we were planted here by the Great Spirit, everything living together in harmony. Our ancestors didn't need no refrigerators or electricity. They dried their meats and berries. They knew the arts of survival. I want to say that in our tradition, there is no such thing as a medicine man or woman. We are only spiritual consultants guided by spirits. Grandmother Earth is the only medicine woman, and what your grandma teaches, you is, you is free. She grows all the medicines and herbs. She alone knows what is good for us. All that uranium, coal, and oil inside her keeps us in balance. When you rip minerals out of her, she gets sick. She, she grew you, just like she grew all the four-leggeds, the wingeds, the insects, the fish. We're all related. And whatever you do to your mother, you do to yourself. So if Mother Earth is injured, What's she going to go? Where's she going to go for help? She has to shake it off to purify herself. That's all these earthquakes and floods. Scientists who pollute, pollute say, we're just doing our job, but the effects aren't our problem. Whether they, they cure you or kill you, it costs like hell, and they charge you to bury you. 
All my life, I was taught to keep back, to shut up, to stay in the kitchen and cook. Then one day in 1973, at Wounded Knee, a newsman put a microphone in front of my face and asked me to say something. So I did, and I've been talking ever since. <laughs> I don't talk that Washington, D.C. language or that college talk either, but your grandmothers were the backbones of your grandfathers, and it's time women put in their two cents about how this country should be run. I want to say right off that women are not ribs, no matter what it says in that Bible. God didn't take a crooked rib and create a crooked woman for Adam. And it's not all her fault we're in this mess today either. It must, it's not true either that only men, man has a soul, not woman or animals. These ideas divide us. We have all been brainwashed. This was in 1972, she's telling me. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, I, thought we, I thought we had another reader, but uh, the, the right reader has declined. So um, I'd like to invite more people to bring up chairs on the stage and to take a minute or two break, and then let's have a discussion about all of this stuff. And by the way, these books are for sale out in the uh, uh, lobby, those of you who came in. And um, uh, let's take a five-minute break, or your ten-minute break. You know where the bathrooms are? Uh, I'll through that door and to your right, there are two bathrooms and uh, long lines, I suspect. <laughs> Thank you. We'll be back in 10 minutes. We're going to have a discussion, uh, discussion whether anyone listens or not. It's okay. But a couple of themes uh, we wanted to discuss. Uh, one of them is called uh, Volume 7. And... Another one is called uh, Story Circles, the revival of story circles. So if I keep talking, I'm actually creating a wave of silence, sweeping over the room, affecting one person after another. So we also thought to have a discussion or a Q&A session where you might ask questions and uh, T. Mike will answer. What? What? <laughs> sure. So uh, the first theme I mentioned is uh, Volume 7. So originally there was uh, Volume 1 was not called Volume 1, it was called Hip Santa Cruz. Later on, after Hip Santa Cruz 2 arrived, Volume 1 had to be retitled Hip Santa Cruz 1. So 1 begat 2, begat 3, and uh, so on. And I had no intention at the beginning that there would be a series or anything. And now I think it's uh, important that it come to an end. Or it wouldn't end if somebody took it over completely but I'm going to start doing whatever part I do after Volume 7. So I've consented to uh, sponsor Volume 7, and uh, that will not exist unless people uh, submit memoirs uh, to be considered as chapters in Volume 7. So Volume 7 will exist if there are enough submissions to make a book. Volume 6 in fact, was completed only because Willard Ford gave us his uh, thesis on Huey P. Newton to include in volume six, and that was 80 pages long. So it's a third of the book, and that was enough to uh, tie up volume six. So that's the story on, on volume seven, and I'm just telling you now so that you can either think about writing something yourself or ask somebody else that you know who would be a candidate. And it has to be about hip Santa Cruz and that of course came to an end in, I don't know if it was 1970 or 1980 or, or, or what. But <clears throat> at the same time we want this ancient history. We also would like uh, young people to be involved so that could be, for example, the uh, 
children of the pioneers, were the grandchildren of the pioneers who felt that there was any important aspect of hip Santa Cruz in the 1960s, which had trickled down into their life as something of importance. So that's the uh, volume seven question. Then <clears throat> I've been uh, mentioning to people that the origin of the hip Santa Cruz history project uh, took place in uh, a lunch in uh, I think maybe the Benten restaurant, a lunch involving me and uh, Judy Lombaugh and Tandy, Tandy Beale. And uh, we, st we started out by interviewing, uh, recording interviews with the people, the pioneers, original pioneers of Hip Santa Cruz, whose uh, interviews uh, comprise the bulk of volume one, Hip Santa Cruz one. So these uh, interviews and memoirs were recorded in what we called uh, story circles, uh, beginning around uh, 1970, I think. Uh, we would meet 10 or 15 or 20 people in a circle in a cafe uh, or my living room or somebody else's living room or even outdoors. And uh, people would take turns holding the microphone in uh, council style and telling the story of their time in Hip Santa Cruz. And that was recorded and posted in a website, my website called ralph-abraham.org slash 1960s. It's still there with a lot more material than has been republished in the book series. So there is an idea around to revive the story circles uh, because if my uh, begging for submissions to Volume 7 didn't suffice to collect enough material. Story circles might, because people will come to a story circle or two or three, and then finally find their voice to tell a story of their time in the 1960s or 70s into the microphone recorded, transcribed in material for a book, um, with or without serious editing. <coughs> That's uh, two ideas I just wanted to present here. So, <clears throat> okay. so that's uh, related to volume seven. We have the idea we're looking for future material. And I know that um, Andrew Bailey has a piece and he may like to speak about that. And Bruce uh, Dammer has a piece and he may be wish to speak about that. And the next uh, half an hour or so we've got as we, as we talk. And uh, I know that several people up here probably have some ideas. Uh, I'm, I don't think we want to mine nostalgia over the 60s, which thank God are gone. You know, I mean, you know, we don't want to beat that dead horse any further or fillet anything else out of the hide. Uh, although there may be some jewels of a story in there. <laughs> in which case, yeah, we want that one. So we never know which one, but we're looking for those experiences that you've had that bring you closer to that sense of community, of understanding that without you, there is no me. Without that grass, there is no bugs, there's nothing. You know, that we're all connected in this, in this web. And the web is transforming as we speak. And we're all going with it. <laughs> like it or not, some of us screaming <clears throat> into the sunset, but still, nevertheless, we're all changing. And we change each other. This we're doing right now is changing us, whether we like it or not. But it's, it's happening. And it's wonderful. And it must be, because we're here. <laughs> and, and so I think these experiences of that change, a lot of us, I mean, I remember sitting in a I guess, yes, I was on acid, but then who wasn't then? Uh, back in the 60s, I was out in Stinson Beach with Steve Gaskin and his uh, group. I'd just been out motorcycle riding and uh, 
pulled into his little, after he left San Francisco, where we were neighbors, and went to San Francisco together, and uh, stayed together, and hung out together. Um, anyhow, I was in this, in the commune that he had at this point, there were about 40 people living in this huge, rambling house, actually between Stinson Beach and Bolinas. And um, as I was sitting there in the room watching everything going on, I realized that everything was happening with perfect synchronicity within that space. For about 15 minutes, somebody would look up and somebody else would get up and go over and bring him back a glass of water. Uh, they brought Steve something and he looked at it and they said, oh, and they went back and brought him his water pipe instead. Uh, nobody said a word. I mean, these things kept happening. And I, as I was looking around and I thought, oh, now that girl over there, she's about 15. That's pretty young. And as I thought that thought, Steve looked over and said, well, she's the daughter of <laughs> the other couple over there, and this is her first acid trip, so be nice to her. <laughs> you know? And I realized at that time that this thing that we used to read about in the science fiction magazines called telepathy was actually alive and well in that particular group of people at that particular moment in time when they were attuned to each other. Uh, and at, at that, as usual, not everybody was on LSD. They were just there, alive, and being part of it and tuning in on the vibes. And that's just one of hundreds of experiences I've had of that nature. And other things, have you ever had an out-of-body experience? And were you as pissed about it as I was? <laughs> you know? Uh, I was not expecting it and did not want it. Uh, on the other hand, I learned a lot that day. You know, the bad trips are sometimes very informative too. But what other kinds of experiences? I one of one of my girlfriends and I were living up in uh, Petaluma area and, and near Lake Inverness, and I was writing in the back room, and she came out and handed me some papers, and I read it, and I said, where'd you get this? She said, it just came through. I said, what do you mean? She said, I was going to write a letter to my dad, and this is what came out. I don't know what the hell to make of it, and it was the next chapter of the book. It was telling me what direction to take in the book, and I was stunned. I hadn't even talked to her about the book. <laughs> At that particular time, it was just a fresh idea. So these ideas, I mean, so many events were occurring, and I know they have for you too. And that's something we need to bring out more into the community to let people know that these things are accessible if we open to them. I don't know any shaman or anybody who wants to try to teach you that stuff. Mostly if they're real shaman, they say, shut the fuck up and run. They don't want anything to do with that <laughs> because they have a different function and that's not it. But just throwing these ideas out, maybe I'm just as wacko as I was always told I was. On the other hand, it's paid off. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's your turn. Does anybody up here want to say anything toward volume seven or any further ideas or story circles or anything else? There are three other people here, and then there are two I know out there busting to speak. Ralph, you want to? Well, uh, I, I think it's a good idea, You're, I think suggesting that uh, aspects of the hip culture in the 1960s which have not uh, been adequately represented in our, our set of six books. And uh, that's on the spiritual side and uh, paranormal experiences and um, the enormous uh, understated importance of, of LSD and DMT and so on. So, uh, uh, it's, it's true in my several uh, contributions to the series. I haven't talked very much about my psychedelic experience, although I have written extensively about in uh, other places. For example, my book, Vibrations and Forms, begins with uh, three chapters of uh, autobiography of uh, psychedelic experiences and the critical importance they have had in my life and mathematical career. So I think it would be great if we had uh, submissions along this line, and um, maybe I will try to correct my mistake by offering a new chapter to Volume 7. <laughs> okay. Now, there are many other channels, and there is a whole future that has to be created. And um, 
we're not going to have a lot to do with it, but we're going to have something to do with it. And uh, I know that uh, two people who have asked to speak, if it's all right with you guys, could I just pass the mic out there for a while, or do you want to grab it for me first? Uh, He's reaching. <laughs> yeah, sure, Fred. Just I mean, what, when you were speaking just a minute ago, I thought about um, in in the memorial of Alan Chadwick, um, which I think was written by Paige Smith, is was he quoted this poem, which seems relevant to to what you were saying, which was. Do not go gentle into that dear night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Right, that's Dylan Thomas. Yes, yeah, Dylan right. Thomas. Yeah, and then, and then there's the one of um, those who those who say don't know, and those who know don't say. And there's a, a, a and that's a, a chorus, a refrain from a beautiful song that was maybe. Um, who who did that? I can't remember. But anyway, oh, that's all I have to say. And I and I and then outside, I, I ran into two people who approached me for further, who um, were triggered for two different projects. The second one was a woman that is working with a clean water initiative and. Dan Halfley, she mentioned, who was um, this important personage of Santa Cruz environmental work, and she um, asked me if I was interested in that because of the comments I made about being on the Water District Board. And then the other woman was from the BBC, uh, a journalist, and she was interested in um, putting together a a piece that would include um, photography or um, images. Um, so anyway, they were both fruitful encounters that um, that spontaneously happen because of today. So. All right. Thank you, Jim. Uh, yeah, I know that a couple of people showed me wonderful photographs and said that uh, they had to share with us, and so I hope we have time at the end. I know there will. We will make time at the end to make that happen. Uh, let me take this out to um, Bruce and to Al. Al. If, if they can go on stage. What? If they can go on stage. Oh, okay. Oh, right, because, of course, the Zoom. Thank you. Hello out there, invisible people. <laughs> Imagine. Okay. Uh, Andy, why don't you come up first and say something, and then Bruce will come up. Oops, and then hopefully, you know, <clears throat> take my position here, I'm going to... I'll stay right here. No, they want to see you. I'm, I'm going to turn around. We, we can, we can stay. Okay. How's that? Does that work? Exactly. Yeah? Okay, that way I can dance. <laughs> and you can still see everybody. I'm not displacing anybody's seats there. Uh, it is, we just drove into Santa Cruz from uh, Loveland, Colorado, where we live on a 450-acre um, intentional community. And um, it's really, really good to be back. I want to just tell everybody that doesn't know that, that I first arrived in this town in January of 1970. What an incredible time to arrive in this town from South Africa, from apartheid South Africa, where I grew up. What's your name? What's my name? I don't know. That's my wife. So do you know my name? <laughs> Connie, darling. It's all new. Okay, so I'm, I'm Andrew Bailey. Uh, there are a lot of people in this room who know me and know me well from a long time ago and more recently, and it's just, I'm so happy to be part of this community. So I'm going to make a submission for Volume 7. And I did make a submission back in probably around Volume 3 or 4, and it fell through the cracks. It just, Ralph did not receive it. I wrote it. It didn't get there. It was the story of how I personally got to Santa Cruz. And I got to Santa Cruz, I'm going to give you the elevator pitch version, by meeting Ralph Abraham, this wonderful bearded gentleman behind me here, in 1970 in London, of all places. And I was about to sail a sailboat across the Atlantic, and I was headed for California, thinking I was headed for graduate work at one of the California colleges. I did not yet know which. 
And Ralph said to me, well, what school are you going to go to? And in England or in the English world, a school is like up to high school and after that it's university. Yes, I think I said, no, I'm not going to go to school. I'm going to go to a university, one of the California universities. He said, you might want to come to UC Santa Cruz. This was 1969. Uh, so it'd been open for, did it open in 68? The college? 65, right, okay. So it was, anyway, brand new campus. He said, you'll love it, you should come. So I did. And I'm going to give you the very quick um, overview, and then I'm going to write this piece in a more extensive way for Volume 7. So I, was, I spent the summer of 69 in London, most of it at the Tate Gallery pop art uh, retrospective, which was amazing and very influential on my life. And I'm a photographer, and I've been a photographer since about 64, 65. That's a whole other story, but I, was, I had some potential in London, but I wasn't thrilled with it, and I was not looking forward to my first winter, because I'm from a place where we don't have winters. Durban, South Africa, subtropical. We have monkeys, we have Zulus, but we don't have winters. So um, here I am in London, winter's coming, and I've got about $45 in my pocket. And it's like, hmm, I'm not sure I like this. And so I had secured a position on a beautiful sailboat to be part of the crew. I'm a sailor, sailing yachts, sailboats. So I got this position on a Rothschild boat to bring it from Italy to, the, to um, Barbados and then to Grenada. And that was how I got here. I let the wind blow me here, and I landed on Thanksgiving of 1969. So I think of myself as a latter-day pilgrim. <laughs> and I married an actual, real, genuine pilgrim whose ancestors landed back in 1620. So that's surprising to me, but that's actually the truth. So how the hell did I get to Santa Cruz? I'm having a farewell party at this little place in this uh, Seed. It was called Seed. It was a macrobiotic restaurant. Never heard of such a thing. And we're having a little farewell party there. And all of a sudden, the doors come smashing open. And in barge, I don't know, 15, 16, 17, really obnoxious, rowdy Americans very obviously Americans, you could tell by the accent. And we're in London, where things are a little more demure. And, hmm, and then the last of my group, I was having a little farewell party, the last of my group, which was maybe nine or ten people, the last one arrives, and he's a black guy named Reggie Jackson. Anybody ever heard of a black guy named Reggie Jackson? Ralph, do you remember the black guy named Reggie Jackson? Look at that smile. Not the baseball player the black New York photographer who was doing very well at the time in London, who had a couple of weeks prior said, oh, you're going to California? You've got to look up this guy. And he shows me a picture of Jerry Garcia. I'm like, I know that guy. And I walk over to the, into the stack of records and pull it up and said, that guy, right? And he says, no, not that guy. Looks like him, doesn't it? Did, still does. So the last person to arrive two weeks later at the restaurant is Reggie. Reggie sits down. The rowdies are behind me. I can't hear a thing. I can't think straight because these people are really, really loud. The amphetamines and the acid do that to you, so I'm told. So he sits down, shakes my hand across the table, looks at the people behind him, and says, Andy, that's the guy you have to meet. So I'm, so I'm totally shy at the time. There's no way I'm going to go. Thank you. Um, here I am. Here's Reggie. I'm shy. He grabs me, drags me across to be leaves the table and introduces me to Ralph Abraham, who says, you might want to come to UC Santa Cruz, gave me his information. And many, many, I sailed across the Atlantic. There were all sorts of hitchhiking adventures in between. At which point, January 1970, I showed up at Ralph's California Street home. And I've got a photograph to prove it. Mm -hmm. And it's in volume five. So if you look in volume five, the previous issue, I've got about 20, 20 photographs there, many of them from 1970 when I first arrived, and then many of them for more, from more recent times. OK, so that's probably enough. Hopefully a teaser. Hopefully you'll want more. Bob's Hold. your uncle. Bob's your uncle. <laughs> Now you have to write it. Yeah. You have a you have a vast 
the Zoom audience out here too, you know. <laughs> Bruce, come on down. Ooh, ooh, good thing you have long legs, dude. <laughs> oh boy. Ooh, haven't seen that done here. <laughs> Thank you. Tell Thank you. you I'm Bruce Damer. I came to Santa Cruz in 94, but I was uh, besmacken by the sort of psychedelic uh, culture here and history here. And one of the people I met through Hip Santa Cruz was a man named Leon Tabori, oh, yeah. who I just fell in love with. He was, I think, Latvian Jew something like that. Leon's background had survived the war concentration camp. Auschwitz. Auschwitz, right. And he had, he was training in psychology, came to North Beach because he was getting a job at San Quentin working psychologically with, uh, with prisoners. And the hotelier said to him, oh, San Quentin, you have to put on your list a man that's a friend of mine who's there. His name is Neil Cassidy. So that's how Leon, so Neon got him out of his cells to do the psychology programs and he got connected with this whole hip movement. And he told me a story once, uh, I, I wouldn't see him a lot because he's such a, and a, he started the barn in Scotts Valley. And, but he told me the story of, and I got started obsessed with Ken Kesey's story and further and things like this. Oh, and he says, oh, I can tell you something. It was like March of 664, he was at Ken Kesey's house in La Honda, which Terry Adams bought, and you can actually go there to their events. It's pretty much the same as it was. The piano is painted by Ken Kesey, it's still sitting there. And Leon says, yeah, they bought this school bus and they rolled it in and it's just all yellow, it's kind of ugly. And, and then suddenly uh, somebody's three-year-old daughter there was an open can of paint. She put her hand in the paint and she pulled it out. And I watched her do this. And she looked at her hand and she started crying because she didn't know what to do. And then Neil, Neil or, or somebody said, that's okay, honey. You can go wipe it off on the bus. <laughs> yeah. So she went over there and she was wiping it off on the fender. And they all got into it and they went to the hardware store. got cans of house paint <laughs> and they're all over the bus just decorating it. So people think that like the day glow kind of multicolored 60s started, it started just like that, right, right then and there. And then they drove it across the country and the rest is a lot of history. So at this time, uh, as I was reading all this history, I came into Timothy Leary's extant archives because I knew his last wife and I helped with that whole team to get them placed at the New York Public Library. But then there were 250 boxes of Tim's stuff that, that didn't have a home. They rejected the material from the storage unit in, in uh, Livermore, so I saved it. So it's been in my barn for you know, 11, 12 years, and now it's been moved up to Oregon to get scanned at a psychedelic uh, community center. But along the way, I got tangled up with the, this hip group and Leon and everything, and I said, well, why don't you guys come out to the farm to uh, have some meetings out at Ancient Oaks. So it's kind of like the original feeling outdoors and whatnot. And I had just bought a bus, a 1960 International Harvester with a 1939 Harvester shell welded to the top of the bus. So it had a nine foot ceiling. And there all the hipsters were suddenly in the bus or on the bus. And at that time I said, this bus has no name. And there's Leon. Leon signed the bus. I realized I said, Leon was there when the bus was created. The idea of being on the bus, you know, even before Jim Fadiman and and the whole the whole thing with Dorothy Fadiman, don't get on the bus. You know, it'll change your life. And so I christened it No Further. And the bus, it's the trip that never stops. So instead of uh, you uh, coming along and, and the bus is about to depart and you get on it and it changes your life for the better or worse, the bus is always there. So, and you visit the bus, the bus is there for you always. And it still sits on our property. We're planning to paint it this year, probably not by hand, but with a nice spray gun. If any of you want to be involved, let me know. And we're going to beautify it. It's our guest house. And in, in the bus are signatures of many people uh, from this community. And so that's how the contribution I'd like to make to volume seven is to 
reflect on things that impacted me, the history, you know, of Peter Demma. And by the way, that, that bus was laid out and designed by no, none other than Andrew way back in the 70s, that the reflection of the power of what happened in the revolution, in that extraordinarily magic thing, is hit people's lives like mine, and, can, and it continues to roll forward. And how, does it, how did it change us now in the 90s, 2000s, et cetera, and beyond with, with you know, Andrew back there in the control room? And just so how do you carry that, for, how is that reflecting forward? How is that rocketing forward? So that, that's what I hope my contribution will, will be. So right. thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, well, anybody else want to say something out here? There's so many wonderful people. Here's one. I just have a question, which um, is, do you solicit photographs too? Because I, I would just love to be seeing photographs in these books. And I know probably all of you have some. We didn't have photographs like we have now. But I, w I wish all these, but volume seven, I hope you will really put out the call for photographs from those years. Well, thank you. Ralph, want to speak to that? We can only publish monochrome photographs. And uh, the only place we can put color is on the cover. So in volume six, we have these two paintings are on the cover. Can you say that on the microphone? Yeah, here. <coughs> but there's Re the repeat it. Repeat it. Repeat what you just said. Uh, yes, we're very interested in uh, photographs for the books. And as Andrew said, in uh, volume five, there's a chapter contributed by him consisting of 20 uh, photographs, uh, but they are monochrome in the book. So we can put uh, colored images on the website, but traffic on the website has declined you know, over the years. So um, if anyone has photographs that might grace a future volume, volume seven, in monochrome, then uh, they could be submitted to the editor of volume seven, who is, uh, who'd you say that was? Oh dear, <laughs> me, so um, yeah. You might write this down, or if you have a voicemail, you can just speak to Siri about it, and she'll tell you <laughs> later. Um, you can write, my email is tmikewalker, T, just initial, Mike and Walker, at gmail.com. And uh, I have a mailing address, which um, I'll give you right now. It's 1516 Delaware Avenue. Santa Cruz, on the west side. <laughs> Maybe we can go walking, you know. Um, and uh, that's in Santa Cruz, 95060. And um, we're open, I, it's actually just a little after five, a tick after five, and we have to leave here at around that time. So uh, I'm gonna leave you with that, where to send, submit your materials, written materials, photographs, uh, I know you don't have video clips from that age, thank God. <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but here we are, and here we go, and we're off to seven, I hope, because everybody here, so many, is, seems so enthusiastic. I'm looking forward to seeing what you send us. All right? God bless every one of you, and thank you for coming in. And if a few of you, thank you. And if, if I need three or four of you to help us carry these chairs back.